All right, um, my name is Ahmed, oh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Shukri. So, um, a little bit bio is I am one of the United Nations. What we do is that uh, General Assembly, we bring youth from different, uh, for example, Somali, and then they go to the United Nations headquarters in New York, and um, they meet the General Assemblies and see where the Somali is, where the other nationalities is. So we help them on that kind of events. And also, um, I am one of the Somali National Youth Organizer, uh, Somali National Council uh, for the North America, Canada, and uh, America. So we represent here to see what's going on. And uh, alhamdulillah, first of all, I want to thank uh, there was people behind the scene who are from since this morning, 9 a.m. They have been working really, really, really uh, good. So I just want to say thank you to those uh, we've been observing, mashallah. Uh, very, very, uh, very humble people, and we can't forget them. They're the one who are making this special event go good. So I just want to say thank you. So uh, a little bit, also we do a World Health Organization and UNICEF. We help people or young kids who are orphans, mothers or father or someone passed away. So we go ahead and uh, find before they go to foster care, we make sure they find a Muslim family that they can raise them when they come to the United States. So those are the things that we do, and alhamdulillah. So I will go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, all right, we will start from uh, Ashanur. Um, Ashanur is a racial justice and human rights activist, uh, peace building and uh, conflict resolution specialist, educator, and a writer. She currently is the program and outreach Director for Care uh, Michigan for Safe and Space. Noor is the youngest board member of the Michigan Coalition for Human Rights and a representative for Muslim ARC Speaker Bureau. And also, she is a fellow with the Detroit Equity Action Law, a program of Wayne State Law Schools addressing structural and systemic uh, challenges in Detroit. And uh, she previously served as an ad advocacy and civic engagement specialist for National Take on Hate program. Uh, Noor has worked both domestically and abroad. Somalia, Brazil, Colombia, Bolivia, and also Detroit with uh, communities including women and African American, which is Afro indigenous. Um, and also she holds MS in conflict analyst and resolution from George Mason University School for Conflict and Analysis and Resolution and, and BA in political science from Michigan State University. All right, clap for her. And also uh, Kafi Ahmed, Kafia Ahmed, sorry. Uh, Kafia Ahmed is a Minneapolis-based activi uh, activist and community organizer. She spends the better part of the last decades organizing black Muslims and refugee communities on issues related to access, criminal justice, foreign policy, and provision of uh, gender-based violence. Uh, for the past five years, her work has focused on com combating the government's uh, countering violent extremes, which is CVE and uh, program. Kafia also along with uh, a, a dedicated group of black women organizers have taken on this program and continue to fight for their community. Kafia has MS in, uh, Kafia has an MS which is Masters in Peace and Conflict Resolution from American University School of International Service. In her spare time, she loves to listen to products, read and travel whenever possible. Last but not least, um, Sheikh Hussain uh, Nuh is the executive director of Bakara Siddiq Islamic Center. Uh, we, uh, we came together also from Columbus, Ohio. So, <laughs> and uh, he is uh, also, Sheikh Hussain will work focus on youth uh, mentoring, spiritually activist, interfaith dialogue, and community building. And he is also SICO director, one of the Somali Islamic Centers of Ohio. And also a co-founder and associate executive director for Institute of Horn of Africa Studies and Affairs. Sheikh Hussain also advocates for the human rights issues in Horn of Africa. Sheikh Hussain holds a degree in biochemistry and microbiology from 
as Liam University and is currently working on his master's. Uh, welcome all our speakers of board. All right, what we will do now, every person has 10 minutes uh, and we will be <laughs> taking the time serious this time. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you to all the organizers and everyone for inviting me tonight. I'm really excited to be here and to get to talk to all of you. Um, my name is Kafi Ahmed. I'm a Minneapolis-based organizer. I lived actually in the D.C. area for three years um, while I was in school, but I'm now uh, back in Minneapolis. and. I do a lot of community organizing in the Somali community. I've been organizing since I was about 15 years old. And the reason I actually became an organizer is because there are so many issues in the Somali community that needed people to advocate on. But there was, in, in so early in the community's history, there was no one to really do that, right? Like our parents were kind of doing the work of surviving and we were supposed to be in school learning. but our elders and a lot of people in our community were missing out on opportunities or being pushed out of systems or fundamentally oppressed because they didn't have someone to advocate for them and speak for them and you know the language barrier made that worse so I started organizing um, actually around housing issues with Somali elders who were in public housing and getting them all the services that they needed and then went into more youth advocacy and criminal justice work a lot of the work that I've been doing around countering violent extremism started when I was uh, in college at the University of Minnesota. And at the time, it was when the 20 Somali boys from Minneapolis went back to Somalia um, uh, to join Al-Shabaab. And then we had FBI elements kind of hanging around campus trying to interview us and trying to find out information because the way that the FBI found out that the boys had left was because of you know their parents and other elders in the community being concerned about where they were going um, the our federal investigation apparatus was not really knowing what was going on or up to date or prepared to handle those things um, but so what turned into a curiosity of our elders to try and figure out what was happening where the boys were going turned into an all-out surveillance state on the Somali community in Minneapolis and that grew into what is now considered the countering violent extremism or under the Trump administration the countering violent Islamic <laughs> extremism which th I mean that's what it was anyway they just changed the name um, so CVE for those of you who don't know was a program initiated by the White House it was a special project of the Obama administration which started with the White House summit in 2011 where they invited out Somali community members and um, sheikhs mostly men and I think that's an important thing to point out is that a lot of the people who have been major proponents of the program have been male elders and and the majority of the people who have been impacted negatively have been young men in the community. Um, and so they invited people to come out to the summit and then that summit turned into what is now CVE. And CVE is a pilot project in Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and Boston. And those communities were chosen as places where the administration could launch this pilot program to see if there was ways to politically re-educate the communities and to fundamentally change how they operate and um, and essentially like throw money at the problem, a problem that they believe was persistent and um, really insidious in the community. So there's a couple of um, problems with that, which is like the fundamental premise of the program is wrong. Um, the FBI's own report in, 2007, in 2015 pointed out that, uh, quote, there is no way to predict someone's uh, likelihood of being radicalized. So there is no scientific study, there is no academic works. Um, because if there was a way to change, to predict people's behavior, I think we would be doing a lot, you know, more interesting things with it. You know, our, the U.S. government would be doing a lot more interesting things with it than hanging out with Somali kids in Minneapolis. Um, but part of the reason that the program was launched in Minneapolis is because the Somali community in Minneapolis represents the intersection of a lot of interests of the United States government, which is they're a immigrant refugee community, they're a poor community, they are black, and they are Muslim. So it is like the Intersect, the intersection of a lot of um, oppressed and deeply marginalized communities and it is you know an easy get right like there's not a lot of people who are going to fight the government 
in their efforts to try and criminalize an entire community that is poor um, and does not have the ability, or to their belief, does not, didn't have the ability to fight back against this program. And so the way that they were able to get this program to start was by offering money. And for a community that has seen profound disinvestment over the course of the last 15 years. Like, the Somali community was better funded. Um, I moved to Minneapolis when I was six in 1995. We were better, better funded then than we were in the year 2005. Um, and that's because of a strategic disinvestment in the community through the efforts of philanthropy, city and state government, and also federal government. Um, and so while can, you know, conservatives send this myths of like the of the like the immigrant, the poor black immigrant who's taking everybody's jobs and living off of you know the welfare state. Really, the, the only way that the community was able to build any kind of wealth was through like Hagbed or Ayuto or through systems where we were supporting one another and helping people start business. And if anyone's been to Minneapolis, you've seen you know um, uh, it's kind of like the fear of a lot of white people. You know, it's a community with a lot of Muslims, people who are deeply proud to be Muslim, who are very proud to be Somali and who own a lot of businesses and who control a lot of things in that community. We still have our issues, but, you know, we're not, so many people are not known globally to be shrinking, you know. We're not people that are easily assimilated into another. We'll make you Somali before you make us anything else. <laughs> um, and I think that, that fed into the fear of the federal government. So they started giving money to these small organizations, parents' organization, organization that was for youth poetry, um, uh, organizations that are supposed to provide services who are, you know, organizations that are owned and run by Somali people would give them money, 30, 60, 100, $250,000, which for a lot of these organizations is the difference between being able to provide service and not existing at all. And so, of course, a a lot of these people, and I'll say because you know I'm a Muslim, my the premise that I start with is that a lot of these people took money because they believed that the money they were taking were going to help people, and that it wasn't their belief that th this money was going to, you know, cause the criminalization of their youth and end up, you know, at the end of the story we end up with ten young Somali boys in federal prison for thirty to forty years, charged with what is essentially a thought crime, right? Like none of them actually committed a crime but they watched a YouTube video or they thought about it and now, you know, a lot of these people's kids are at risk. But they took this money, that money helped, you know, them to have these organizations and then they started what is, uh, so I will say this program is co-operated through many different government agencies, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and um, a couple of smaller agencies, but it's one of those like coalition efforts, which is rare, because if you know anything about the government, they don't know how to work together. But when it's like, when they're trying to root out terrorists, I guess that's when, you know, work starts getting done. Um, and it started with an initial investment of about $30 million. I'll kind of end there and get into more detail later because I think my time might be up. Am I? Yep. My bad. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So I don't want to be very redundant. A lot of the things that we're going to speak about uh, on this panel kind of overlap. Our general premise today was to talk about Islamophobia and to touch on the Muslim ban and sort of some of the ways in which Islamophobia has manifested in our community and like broadly the Muslim community. Similar to Kafia, I started organizing probably around the time I was 16, 15 or 16 years old. I actually grew up in this community um, most of my life. And many of you remember how life was following 9-11, being a part of the Dar Hijra community, our mosque being called the 9-11 mosque all over the news. Um, so many things that happened that transpired during that period of time, whether it was you know the FBI at our door, many of our families getting raided, uh, living in a sort of surveillance uh, area, and just kind of the fear and the mistrust that really took root in our mosque and also in the Somali community, as well as consequences of having those in our community incarcerated on trumped up charges and things of that nature. So I, I think this is safe to say, unless you're really young, that you remember that period of time and some of those issues have persisted and have a new ugly head. So 
Yeah, unfortunately. And so I just wanted to talk about Islamophobia in its most basic sense, is defined as dislike of or prejudice against Islam or Muslims, especially as a political force. That definition actually makes no sense at all because what's happening to the Muslim community isn't simply, oh, we don't like Muslim people, so we're going to throw a slur here and there. That's in its most basic sense. And that's not even what's truly dangerous or what's actually going to dissolve our community ties. What is is the Islamophobia that is structural, that is systemic, that functions within institutions, that holds parts of our community back, whether it be through incarceration, whether it be through policies around immigration, whether it be through other policies around the Muslim ban, so on, so on and so forth. And so I feel like, I wouldn't say so much in our community, but when I speak to other Muslim communities, predominantly those of other backgrounds, whether they be Arab or, uh, or South Asian, their concerns around Islamophobia have absolutely nothing to do with some of the concerns that we have. I always have people coming to me like, let's have coffee and donuts with the Islamophobes and we're just gonna make it go away. And I'm like, no, because them liking us is not my concern. I could care less. My concern is about what happens to the young women and men in our community, with, whether it's through incarceration, whether it's through other punitive issues, whether it's deportation. We have so many people in our community who are undocumented, mm -hmm. who are having immigration issues. You think that Islamophobia has nothing to do with the way our immigration system is set up? Do you think that our communities are impacted by the rhetoric? A lot of people don't understand the fact that what Trump says, right, or other bigots say, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not oh, something that happens and it goes away. Rhetoric and negative ideologies against our community definitely gets codified into policies, policies that directly impact us. So yes, on one hand, it doesn't really matter what people think about us, but when those who are highest in power have these comments and negative depictions of our community, it actually impacts the ways in which we live our life. And so I think that's a really important thing for us to think about and really be critical about. And another thing that also comes to the forefront of my mind when I'm thinking about the issue of Islamophobia is that it is not a single issue area. We shouldn't just focus on Islamophobia. We have to understand that there is an intersection, like Kafia said, of our community that is suffering from poverty, um, from anti-blackness, from xenophobia, from lack of access to resources. And so when those things are compounded, that means our community is more targeted. And we are going to experience the manifestations of Islamophobia differently than another Muslim community or a community that might be perceived to be Muslim. So that's another thing that we have to address. When we're talking about our community, I was recently re reading a study, please someone correct me if I'm wrong, was that the medium income for Somali families it annually is $22,000 a year. How many of you knew that? Sounds like a lot. I mean, and, and it might be higher, right? But I'm, or lower. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we're thinking about our community or when we're talking about our community, we focus on anti-blackness or on Islamophobia, but we don't focus on poverty and how poverty actually impacts us in these ways and makes these policies actually impact our lives negatively and more adversely. So I think poverty is something that we really need to address in our community. And another thing that we should be focusing on, not to say that Somalia is not our concern, because 110%, I know all of us are living one foot here and the other in Somalia. We are always thinking about what's happening to our ancestral land, what's happening to our family and relatives over there, people we may not even know because we have that deep tie to our homeland and that should never ever go away. But at the same time, many people act like what's happening in our backyard is not our concern. 
So growing up, we'd always get together as a community, like all Agba Samali Lo Ulurinaya, Wahana Laga Desaya, Dekedba Laga Samainaya. But we're not focusing on institutions that should be built here. Because when our young men and women are being incarcerated or are facing challenges around fault, a neg a fake entrapment cases, we don't have the institutions that are ready to deal with that because everything we've been doing for the past 25 years has been with the mindset that we're going back to Somalia tomorrow. And I know it's probably an un unpopular opinion, but we cannot be here and have our children go to universities and try and have job opportunities and so on and so forth and actually resist against an, uh, an, uh, an oppressive system and to resist against policies that are meant to break us down if we have nothing built in place. So I just want to leave on, I mean, one person agrees with me, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't want to, you know, just like beat this over the head, but I just cannot say how important it is to actually build institutions in our name, in our backyard, and actually support other organizations and support other communities of color and those who are marginalized. Because we're not gonna get anywhere as a tiny insular community that has so many challenges upon us if we aren't willing to step out and actually show up for other causes. First of all, it's un-Islamic, that's number one. And number two, it's extremely selfish to be like, okay, I'm going to ask the Latinx community to support me on XYZ. I'm going to ask um, the Asian community, the so on and so forth, to do for me something I would never do for them. And I think that that's a mindset that we have to really move beyond. And I think that it comes from the parents' generation to say, you don't only need to focus on issues impacting Somalis, but as a Muslim, you have to focus on issues that are impacting all of us in this country, those who are more marginalized than us, those who are deeply impacted by these policies. And that's the only way to move forward in terms of building an equitable future for all of us, all communities of color, all individuals who are oppressed and marginalized and facing challenges in this country. Um, and I'm just gonna end with CBE. I know that uh, Kathy had touched on that. And it's such an important thing for us to really not buy into this notion that we are an inherently violent people or that there is something wrong with us or that we are the driving force for negativity in this country. We are being used as puppets and as scapegoats in this issue. I've heard a couple of times from folks that if we have nothing to hide, why don't we just let the federal government come in, or the FBI, or these foundations and philanthropists who are saying that you know Muslims are more prone to radicalization, so on and so forth. What many don't understand is they don't need much to build a case on you. Many of the people who are rotting in prison because of this issue might have done a thought crime or I was just hearing about in Ohio, some of the individuals who are actually in jail around supposed radicalization were just friends and family of folks who actually went abroad. So I think it's something that's extremely dangerous and I think that when countering violent extremism program comes into our community, we need to stand firm and say no. Because if they do not have buy-in, if they do not have people in our community saying, yes, come surveil us, yes, accept the narrative that we are inherently violent people, then guess what? They can't do anything to us. So that's my advice. Um, <clears throat> Bismillah. Um, SubhanAllah, they said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> they made me feel like they went my, you know, my point by point, so I don't have anything to say now, except to say that uh, as someone who you know, mentors the youth, someone who teaches them, and I'm talking about Islamophobia, uh, it really tears me apart. It bothers me when you know, a tragedy like, you know, what happened in San Bernardino or, or, or France, whenever something like that happens. And one of my students, especially the sisters, call me and they say, uh, brother said, I feel like calling sick tomorrow. I don't want to go to school tomorrow because people will look at me with some sort of, you know, suspicion. You know, that really bothers me. And 
I keep telling them that you don't have to feel that way. You are as American as anyone else. So to me, Islamophobia is irrational fear based on ignorance. And it's promoted, I mean, it's a multi-million dollar, if not billion dollar industry promoted by very powerful institutions, foundations, very influential figures in this country. When someone like, uh, I'm not going to mention names, but when a well-known um, politician says, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, it's not, our problem is not radical Islam, but Islam itself, and this will be publicly broadcasted. That will have an effect on how people view us Muslims. Um, movies like uh, The Sniper, or True Lies, or Under Siege, or what was the last one, uh, Patriot's Day, I believe. These will always promote Islamophobia, and, and people will always view us as, you know, the others. So, and it will be like that unless we challenge this. Uh, we live in a country where s more than 63% of the people in this country never met a Muslim or never had a conversation with a Muslim. Uh, we live in a country where uh, more than 52% believe that we Muslims are not loyal to this country. A country where more than 50% say, I don't want to have a Muslim as my neighbor. So this is really very serious when the highest person who's sitting right now in the highest you know, uh, um, office in this country publicly demonizes Muslims. I mean, this is the reality we're facing. And I think it's time, and I'm going to make this very short, that we talk to our neighbors. We educate them. I, my brother Abu Karaman knows one of the things we do in our Islamic Center is a, a program called Meet a Muslim, where we invite people from our local church, the synagogues and the temples, just to, to meet us, to talk to us, you know, to eat with us, uh, just to uh, overcome and break that psychological barrier. You know. So I will come to how to deal with Islamophobia. I will address that in the next part of, of, of our session. I understand that there will be a lot of questions. So I, I just want to say that uh, it's very serious and it's irrational fear based on ignorance and we need to challenge that. Otherwise, it will get worse. Thank you. All right, if anybody has any questions. Oh. Here. All right. <laughs> okay, Thank you, um, all three of you. And I just want to say I love how many <coughs> intelligent, really dedicated Somali women we have in our community. And I can't wait to see our young boys being supported and facilitated in the right way so they can be up there too, because I want y'all to talk. So for, um, for the brother, you know, I remember when I went to college, I went to a big white uni Southern University. It's incredibly racist, incredibly racist, and of course Islamophobic. I had a lot of talks with white people who called me a terrorist in the newsletter, in, the, in our newspaper, huge newspaper, um, who said Muslims are this, Muslims are that. I wrote all these op-eds, and I really thought that if I sat down and had coffee with them and explained, I really thought it was ignorance. Right, I really thought, and then I realized and had to check myself that Muslims have been here for 400 years. Before even colonization, actually before even that, Muslims were here. But since colonization, this land was taken away from Native people, Muslims have been here for 400 years. One third, 33% of the Africans stolen by Europeans and forced to come here were Muslims. And they have maintained, they have tried to, and they have maintained their Islam in many ways. And there's a large African-American Muslim community. And so it's not that these people don't know about Islam. It's that they actually do. And this is how you have a systemic, um, uh, global killing of Muslim, country, of Muslim people and invading a Muslim country. And so my question is, is that I really don't have a question. I just want to say, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I'm a like, I've been there, and I do human rights work. I do grassroots organizing. These people know better than we do. 
So there's one hand do Dawa and teach people about Islam, and we have our prophetic tradition, some of the worst people who hated Muslim and they became Muslim. Yes. We have to think about structures. Those are individual people. And so we have to be very careful about where we spend our energy because it could be very draining, right? And we want these people to accept us. The thing is, is that we're in a crisis. And I think that it's really important who we welcome into our, into our communities. You know, African American Muslim communities know this better than we do. And we need to be working with them, right? Other black Muslim communities and other Muslim communities. They know about us. They know about black Muslim people. So can you tell me about like what experiences you've had that make you think that this is a like a good tactic to have? Like has it worked for you and your organization and your community? You know, there's a there's a Somali saying that says Shahari or Ibn Garni. <laughs> when two people are actually both saying the truth, which is which is very interesting. And the complexity about trying to keep contradictory concepts in your mind is what makes us really think deeper. So I think maybe, and I'm going to not even speak for Shah Hussein, but I think where he's coming from and where you're coming from are maybe contextually different. I agree with you. There's way too much energy babysitting Adam people. and. <laughs> That's my sister. It's not our job to, to, to hold their hand and, you know, when we are faced with everyday micro and major aggressions, right? So I, I hear you. But I think we need what Sheikh Hossein's mosque is doing at an institutional level. Because there is a difference when you're communicating for, for a peer-to-peer -peer level and when you're trying to establish a coalition with other faith groups and then together tackle that system of oppression. Because today is Islamophobia. Yesterday was uh, anti-Jewish. Uh, the day before it was somebody else. So these are cycles of things that keep happening. And I, I really would want you guys to put it in a context so that, you know, in a way, that's what he Yeah? Right. So, so I, I, I honestly think we all have a valid contribution to do, but the individual efforts need to have communal and institutional advocacy. And to do that, whether it's the African American community and their Islamic institutions, or whether it's simply their, you know, race relations and anti-racism groups, you know, the best books I read lately are Tanahasi Coates' books, right? Where he articulates the issues of this country that needs to atone for. America needs to atone a whole lot of history. But we are now caught in that history and criminalizing young black males is a reality that we cannot run away from. So I just wanted to contextualize that. Thank you. Anybody else have any more questions? All right. Oh, oh, this is an actual question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I actually did want to piggyback off of your remarkable comments, which is really contextualizing the issue, right? We need to look at it from like a community level, but if we're combating institutionalism, Asha, as you've spoken to it, Shahur said, my question to you is, how can we learn from our, the Arab community in Virginia? They've been very, very vocal. They're in CNN, they're in BBC, and maybe Asha, you can also contribute a bit to this as a Virginia native. Um, but I think in Ohio, we need to understand how to frame our discussions and Islamophobia in a way where we are reaching mastery media. And I think the Arab community has done that, I don't want to say successfully, but they are out there. Um, whether they're on Instagram or they're having rallies, they're, they're very much there. Um, and second is, why are we not a part of those circles? Like, what is the, is there a division between the outer community and the Somali community that's just not visible to me? Um, and can we bridge that? Um, and then finally, the question that I had was, what are safe spaces? Where can we go to combat Islamophobia within us? How can we have an engaged discussion? Um, can we name some organizations that we can participate in? So. Um, let me address this in a broader context. Um, I just want all of us to visualize a scene, and I'm talking about the first uh, public speech 
um, our Prophet peace be upon him made when, when he came to Medina. So this is the first time where he was addressing um, multi-religious, multinational, you know, people, like the Jewish community, uh, the Christians, um, you know, uh, and, and according to uh, the Islamic history, Muslims in Medina were less than 9% at that time. And also take into consideration the fact that people were waiting the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? And they were talking about him. So Islamophobia was there. People were, they really wanted to see this man. Um, if you think about this narration, the, the, the man who brought us to this narration was a Jewish rabbi. His name is Abdullah ibn Salam. Um, he looks at the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he says, As soon as I saw him, I knew that this face wasn't a liar. Which means um, the attitude of our Prophet, peace be upon him, would, would really dismantle people, would, you know, uh, convert people, if you will. Um, so the f his choice of words, the first thing he said was, Ayyuhan Nas, Afshu Salam wa Tut'imu Ta'am. O people, spread the peace and feed the hunger. Which means, uh, our scholars say, spread the uh, peace means, um, tell people who you are, talk to them, have a communication with them, bring them to your mosque, if you will, your places, talk to them. Right? Uh, we said 63% of the people in this country never met a Muslim. All they know about Islam is what Sean Hanit tells them. Right? So he says, Afshu Salam, spread the peace, talk to them. You know, if you don't speak for yourself, others will define you. So we need institutions that intellectually talk to the people on the public platforms and tell them who we are. And number two, he says, and feel the hungry, which means again, today, we have to come up with institutions that can respond to, to the suffering of the homeless, of the needy. And I think our Arab brothers and sisters, even though I am more into the Desi community, the indo pak I think Sheikh Mohammed Hussein and Abu Karman who are here are more privy to a lot of information within the Arab brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, so this is what our Prophet peace be upon him said. So that's how he dealt with Islamophobia, you know, volunteering, uh, joining local uh, organizations. So I think if we want to overcome that psychological barrier where people view us as, you know, the fifth element, as the others, as the enemy, you know, uh, I think we need to take that prophetic model. Uh, what was your last question? I are there any organizations you said? Yeah. I think I know my brother from Hell Behind is here. I used to work for Hell Behind. I was the West Coast uh, Outreach Coordinator in West Coast, uh, California. Um, we used to have a program called uh, Mercy on Wheels. Um, skip your lunch to save a starving child, something like that. So we would go to our neighbors. Uh, we would feed them. We would talk to them. And it really worked for us. Um, also, the Meet a Muslim event. Uh, where you invite people and you ask them, you know, is there any questions you have about Islam? It really helped us on a local level. And if you're looking for institutions, I think what ICNA is doing or ISNA or organizations like, you know, Rahma or Mercy on the Wheels can be a, you know, best uh, model. And I think um, the sisters can add some more. Well, I think I caught part of your question, Manav. Uh, I'll talk about the first one. You were asking about kind of looking at the Arab American community and like how they've been able to maybe make some sort of way around advocacy, around Islamophobia, so on and so forth. My take on that is there's a lot of access and privilege that comes with proximity to whiteness, okay? And so when, huh? Oh yeah, or just being white, right? Um, and so I think that the face of Islam, when you're, when you think about it in this country, in the ways in which it's framed, or even globally, is that Arab is synonymous with Muslim, and Muslim is, you know, synonymous with being Arab. And so, oftentimes, when there is an issue, even if it's impacting us as Somalis or impacting African American community, and you turn on the TV, the first pundit is like someone from Palestine. It's like, what? What? Like, what do they have to do specifically with our issues? So, I don't think that they are better at advocacy. I don't think that they're better activists. I don't think they're better strategists. I think they have more access to resources from funders and philanthropists who do sort of org organizing. Around 
around Islamophobia. They have that access, they have those resources, they definitely have the proximity to whiteness or simply being white. Um, and so I think that that's the way I look at it. I don't think that it's uh, something we can learn from them. So I think it's really important to look at access and, 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 and their ability to infiltrate some of those spaces where us as black folks, as black Muslims, don't have that access and people don't really affiliate um, our race and our background with that of being Muslim. And so I think the best solution is we, again, create our own institutions, support our own platforms, support organizations that are really serious about anti-racism. And if we want to learn from the Arab community, which I think is a silly idea, but if we want to build with them, we can definitely build with those who are serious about anti-racism, those who actually go out of their way to support and who are genuine and who are very sincere and who are not using us as tokens or using our plate as some sort of opportunistic venture or goodwill project. So I think if there's genuine solidarity there, I'm for it. If you're really serious about anti-racism work, I'm there for it. But just simply emulating a, a group or a subgroup that has different access, I, I think that that's just, that's not my solution. Um, Trying to address all the questions. Um, Make sure so you hurry because you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, to Asha's point, yes, I think that it's difficult for us to make comparisons to other communities. I think the closest comparisons that we would have is to other m immigrant Muslim communities. So those, you know, our brothers and sisters from Senegal, Nigeria, communities that are also black, but um, immigrants um, and also Muslim. I think the difficulty with a lot of Desi and... Um, they see in Arab communities is yes their affiliation is automatically with Islam even uh, even though the vast majority of Muslims are from East Asia and from Sub-Saharan Africa but also they exist in a space where they are only one step from being white right like they're only one identification from being white if they are um, if they weren't if they were you know, like for a lot of people, Syrians, Lebanese people, they are white, right? And if they weren't Muslim or if they weren't foreign, they would be in that kind of upper echelon of power. And they're, and it's kind of like what people say about um, black men and white women, they're only one step away from being white men. And so they're always <laughs> jostling to get into that power position. It's not, and so for those of us who are in the multi, who have multitude of things that prevent us from being in the power position, you're an immigrant, you're black, you're Muslim, you're X, Y, and Z we don't really have that luxury. And I think that that is a good thing in terms of our Islam. This is a test for our community having to come to this new country and uh, build something for ourselves. But I also think it's an opportunity. And one of those opportunities is that when we do the work, um, I appreciate Brother Hershed's point about you know the prophet and you know, dealing with Islamophobia in the prophet's time. What I think we should do is try to also contextualize why we're doing what we do. Are we doing the meet a Muslim thing to appease whiteness and structures of power and to do like a PR campaign for Islam? Um, or are we doing it as Dawa to bring more people to the deen and to make them understand the deen, correct? So as much access do, as these people have to Fox News, they have to Google. So as much as they want to hate Muslims, they can Google and learn more about Islam, right? So it's not the responsibility of us as the oppressed or marginalized people to drag our oppressors into enlightenment. That is a lot of the time a choice they've made and they intentionally made and they will continue to make and that is not our responsibility. But if we as Muslims are in the space where we want to teach people about Islam, the, the one true religion, and we want more people to become Muslim, then we should be doing that work in that vein, um, and not to make um, Bill and Linda from down the block not stare at me. Bill and Linda can stare all they want. That's time they're wasting. I'm still living my life. So we re just really have to be thoughtful about that. And I also think that there needs to be a really deep discussion within not just the Somali community, but Muslim communities as a whole, having lived in a community that has been under surveillance for years, but over a decade now, white Muslims are used as a tool of the surveillance state. 
there's a lot of people you've all heard the stories of like people who converted to Islam as a means of acting as informants for the government um, multiple horror stories and then there's stories of people who did convert to Islam and believe that Islam fixed their basic understanding of race right like there's a lot of white Muslims who are learning the hard way for the first time in their lives that just because they became Muslim did not erase the years of learned biased behavior towards black people so and they still hold uh, hold those biases in place they may you know be Muslim they may marry a, a black Muslim person but those things become a reality and so a lot of this is about us and the work that we're doing to make sure that we are creating spaces that hold people accountable and include and those people are included in ourselves are we creating spaces that every person has access to them because that is the true nature of the deen right there shouldn't be impediments to becoming a muslim there shouldn't be impediments to you be having access to the masjid is it accessible to those with disabilities is it accessible to mothers who are breastfeeding is it accessible to all kinds of people who are able to hear the message of this deen and to be able to, for us to do the work of you know being the best muslims we can be in this life and the answer to that question for the most part is no we're not doing it we are um as the brother abuka said we are creating more impediments to people you know enjoying the luxuries of islam instead of breaking those barriers we are finding ways to tell new ways to tell people in our communities how they should act how the like we're holding somali girls to these unbelievable standards that they can't hold and we're telling our boys that they can just do whatever they want and if they wake up from bed that's an accomplishment <laughs> and that's that's not fair to the girls and it's also not fair to the boys and we're doing a disservice to all of us by doing things like that and this, uh, you might be wondering, what does it have to do with Islamophobia, Kafia? Well, I, th I, think the, I, think it's, I think Islamophobia, the premise that sustains it is the idea that we have to prove our humanity to others again and again and again. And I'm here to tell you that you will never be able to prove that you are a worthwhile human being to people that hate you. And all you can do is live your life. And if as Muslims, our idea, our work in this life is not to prove to the people that hated, the Prophet didn't go around trying to prove that Islam was worthwhile to people. He was a Muslim. He was kind and he was helpful and he was giving to those who were in need, no matter who they were. And that is, that is how others came to Islam, by watching him and his example. That is the Sunnah. So I feel like if we as a community focused on a return to the sunnah instead of talking about um, why is her skirt so short or why is so and so not doing this and focus instead on our deen because I'll tell you this if you were focused on whether or not you were going to get in Jannah you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have time to be talking about other people's clothing because you would be wrapped with guilt constantly so we need we as a community just needs to back away from trying to prove to anybody and that includes white people that includes Arabs that includes the shayu who have created an industry around our you know the failings of our iman and build a one one to one relationship with Allah because that's why we don't have a clergy system that's why we don't have a pope because you don't need any intermediaries between you and Allah I work with Helping Hand uh, on Palestinian. Um, you know, everyone knows that Palestinians, everyone just, everyone, everywhere we go, we just tell people we're Palestinian, like we're vegan or something, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, how do we rise above Islamophobia? It's a very hard thing to answer. Okay. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I grew up in Arizona. Arizona, as a lot of people know, is very, very racist. I grew up in high school. I went to high school that had 30 Muslims. Me, my brother, and someone else, I had no idea who they were. Um, the way that I dealt with it was, you know, a community, a safe space, like everyone's talking about, like massage of communities, but outside of that, you know, exploring different cultures. Um, one thing that I've noticed about, about Northern Virginia is that there's no place. You know, you can go up to someone right. white, brown, black, whatever, no one really cares. Um, it's very different That's than being on the West Coast or different parts of the, uh, really of the United States. Islamophobia is something that's just prevalent. I think it's in the media, and I think we just need to face it on an uh, individual that's level. Yeah. We can't do it by the masses at the moment. We have so many things, but besides that, I don't really have much advice, to be honest. Um, just move on with your life, you know? Like, don't let anyone else stop you from living your life. Like, you decide who your identity is, not anyone else. <laughs> and, no, I was put on the spot. I wasn't...
I, I think Sister Fozia already sums it up because this issue is not either or, you know, because it's multifaceted, and I think all approaches are necessary. The one that defends the legal aspect, the one that says I don't have to apologize for who I am, and the one that says let's talk about this. All of them are bad at different stages. Uh, but I want to underscore one thing that someone already said, and I don't know exactly who, please forgive me for that, which is living as a Muslim, that is really the right way of countering uh, Islamophobia. Uh, Umar ibn Abdaziz anhu used to say, call people to Islam while you're silent. And then people asked them, and they said, what do you mean by silent? Because you have to engage people. He said, just live the religion. Then that way people will see. But that's a long term, though. It's not something that's going to change people's views about us in these challenging times. So we have to be active. One of the things that each one of you has an uh, opportunity for is engaging those people who spread hate through social media. Now, this is the biggest form, of course, uh, platform that you can engage people, educate them, for example. You know, Islamophobes have only one line that they repeat, for example. They will take a verse from the Quran and they will repeat that, yes, they want to chop everybody's head off, for example. You know, and there are many ways to counter that without being really uh, mean about it. But if you look at the Bible, I mean, if you, any of you can Google up uh, the violent verses that are in the Bible, for example. You're talking about in the hundreds. We're talking about genocide, you know, an order that says completely kill everybody, their fathers and their mothers and their children and so forth, and well documented. So that kind of person, you can say, if you have a concern about this, here is a list of these verses. So if the issue is not that, then let's talk about what's the real issue. If it is foreign policy, if it is why people are angry at us, and you know those kind of things, let's have a discussion about it. And that's what we have for the as, as for Muslim, for example, was a means to, to create that kind of environment where people can ask straightforward the questions that they're interested to learn and then to give them a chance for others to present that. Not to sugarglaze anything. You know, I mean, we're, this dean teaches about to talk about everything, period. You know, that's it, you know, everything. You know, there is no shyness about it, there is no hiding nothing about it, there is no sugarglazing. So we talk about some of these things. Some of the people will raise questions that are very crude, that will offend even some of the attendees. But you have to educate your own community as well to be ready for that. You know, and then address those questions accordingly. So, Thank you for putting me on the